After the romance between the Labour Party and the new Nigeria People's Party, the rumoured merger between both parties has stalled. The candidate of the new Nigeria Party, NNPP, Rabi Kwakwanto, over the weekend stated he can't be a running mate to the Labour Party candidate, Peter Obi, also saying that the South East will miss a golden opportunity if Peter Obi refuses to be his running mate. The NNPP candidate also added that the Igbos are at the bottom in politics. Reacting to the remarks by the NNPP presidential candidate, Buba Galadima highlighted that Peter Obi's best bet is to accept to be Kwakwaso's running mate and that the Labour Party candidate is suited to be vice president because of his experience in economic issues. Joining us on the show this morning to discuss the alliance between both parties and his take on recent remarks from the presidential candidate of the NNPP is Peter Obi, presidential candidate of the Labour Party. Good morning, sir. Welcome to The Morning Show. Good morning, and good morning for inviting me. So let's start off with those comments from Senator Rabiu Kwakwanso, presidential flag bearer of the NNPP. He said several things, including the fact that the North will not vote for you, Peter Obi, that they would rather vote for a Northern candidate. He also talked about the fact that the South East has problems, in quotes, such that the North will not be voting from a person from the South East. What's your take on that? Well, let me... The comments from my respected elder brother, Kwankwasu, is the reason why we have 100 million Nigerians living in poverty. The reason why we have 18 million Nigerian children out of school it is the reason why we have over 55% of Nigerians in under unemployment ladder. It's the reason why we have all the problems why Nigeria is insecure. Because rather than vote for competence, we will choose to vote for incompetence based on a primitive consideration of ethnicity and religion. Tell me, today you can't travel from Abuja to Kaduna by air, by road, by train. Is it because someone from the South East is in charge? You can't travel from Abuja to Mina by road. Is it because somebody from the South East is in charge? Yesterday we, have, we had an attack by bandits on the presidential convoy in Kansuna. Is it because the president from South East is in charge? Show me where you can buy food cheaper, you have uninterrupted electricity, or people are prospering in the North, because the northerners are in power, in the southwest because they are in power, and in the southeast. What we've chosen to do in this country, we will consistently hire vehicle drivers to fly the Nigerian aeroplane, instead of hiring qualified pilots. My commitment is let us campaign and deal with issue of the problems of the country. There's a lot of problems besieging this country. If you don't know today, this country will soon default in their death service. Now we'll be at a junk status. That's what should be preoccupying us now. So our schools, universities are shut down and we're talking about who we'll vote for. Let's deal with the issues. This election will not be based on my turn. It will not be based on ethnicity. It will not be based on religion. It will be based on the Nigerian agenda to save this Nigeria. Nigeria is in coma. And you need a specialist. And that is what I'm offering. To save his life or he will die. It is not about where, whether this person am appealing to people to vote to save Nigeria. And to save Nigeria is to hire the best. I don't want people to vote for me because I'm from the Southeast. I don't want people to vote for me because I'm from South-South or I'm from 
southwest or northwest or northeast or north central. I want them to vote for P2B because it's a Nigerian who is competent to start pulling Nigeria out of the mess it is today. He also said that, you know, the Igbos are, are on the lower ladder of Nigerian politics. I mean, we keep hearing that word. In fact, when we had uh, uh, a spokesperson of the NNPP, somebody that, spoke, uh, that did speak on behalf of the NNPP uh, yesterday, uh, I think a couple of days ago, I, if my memory serves me right, that's Elijah Bubba Galadima. He equally enunciated, you know, those views that, you no. Know, it must be the Igbos that are, yeah, it's on Monday. Yeah, thank you so much. That, uh, that um, the Igbos should be the one to be vice presidential candidate. So tell us about everything, about this, you know, NMPP partnership and everything. Is it still working or is it dead on arrival? Well, I'm not going to talk about the, the alliance because maybe some people are talking about alliance, but I want to look at their comments. Often a time, you see, you work here. Often a time, we tend to neglect those on the lower ladder. There might be the solution. There might be the solution. And those comments are comments that should not be on the table today because we have a problem. My candidacy is actually meant to solve those problems, to stop referring those who are higher ladder. Because, okay, those who are higher ladder have brought us where we are. Maybe we need those on the lower ladder to be able to deal with it. And that's what, even his comment, let me take up a large about Bangladesh's comment, which you said. He said, I'm competent to be the vice president because of my knowledge of the economy. Let me tell you, Nigerian problem is the economy. So why do you want somebody who has knowledge of what the, the problem is to be vice? That is what I'm saying. You want to use the, the, the people who should be on reserve bank to be the to start the match, when, no, he mentioned it that I have the knowledge, the Nigerian problem is the economy. It is the economy because people don't have job, because people don't have means of livelihood, you push them into criminality, into agitation, into all sorts of problems we're facing today. And that is what I'm saying, that I have the knowledge to start pulling these people out of poverty. My candidacy, and the team I want to assemble. Young, sharp people will start mitigating the dangers we're facing today. I will start dealing with it, cutting costs in order to be able to pull Nigerians out of poverty, to be able to reduce, go and look at the world. So it is actually what is telling you, what Bubak Gladima said, I will say is Peter B is qualified to be vice president. Everybody have said it, not just Bubba Gandima. You find all that people like Chief Servant in Niger said, everybody said he's competent. But what is the problem of Niger? Economic problem. Right, so I know you're raring to get to the issues, but unfortunately, identity politics is still an issue in this country. So I do also have to raise comments made by Alaji Madi Shehu, chairman of the Dialogue Group on another show on the Arise News Network, where he said that during your time as governor of Anambra, you wanted northerners working in Anambra to wear a badge of identification. Frankly, that sounds like something out of Nazi Germany, where Jews had to wear a yellow badge, and that it was only until the intervention of Senator Rabiu Kwakwansu that you then backed down from that idea. He also raised this issue that was trending on social media an allegation that your son was the person pictured who was dressed in Biafran attire standing on the Nigerian flag. I'd like you to address those two issues. Well, I will even add that the mentioned issue of my sponsoring at POB. Let me tell you, I've said it. One, go and check the records and check his facts. I've never been involved in sponsoring any agitation, be it IPOB or no one. I've never. In 2017, which I'm sure you referred, I made a comment. I said, I, I pop and all other agitations as a result of leadership failure over the years that failed to address the critical areas of development. 
So it was the creation of the sins were a creation of government. And I can say today that if I'm in power, I would deal decisively with all agitations through dialogue and through, through proper leadership. And when I finish that, if there are remnants of criminal in it, I deal with it decisively. That's what is happening everywhere. I follow the issue of agitations globally. I do things with studies, and it can be dealt with. An issue of badge and identification is a lie. It never happened. And let me tell you, throughout the time I was governor, Kwakwaso never visited me. I can't remember. If I, I probably haven't met Kwakwaso until maybe, I don't know, it's, there are people I met maybe after I became governor or not close to him. You know, he's somebody that I see as a senior brother, respect me, but he never visited me as a governor or intervened on anything. And to tell you why it's a lie, all the commissioners that sat with me throughout the time I was in office are from the north. I never had the privilege of having any commissioner from southwest, south-south. They are all from the north. can show you six of them, from John Haruna, most of them, if I told them I'm from Kanu, my ADC, Mohammed, is from Kanu. So who will I give the order? Will I give them one order to go and tell them with their own people? Will I give them one order? Will I give them one order to go and deal with their own people? No, every other person calls his brother, his sister, or his mother. Listen to me, his ADC. My ADC is from Kanu, and we remain close to today. Very, very close. You can go and ask him. I'm not somebody who asks that. On the issue of my son, it is not my son. My son is a professional who is consumed by his... Yeah, let me tell you, I just came back from London. I can't even see my son. He's, he's consumed by her work. He will tell me, that, listen, Dad, I like, oh, how are you? How is politicized your campaign? I like what you're doing. Do you know I can exchange my messages with my son? My son will tell you, listen, Dad, I don't have time for this. I did this and this. I stayed in a week in New York. I could not see my son because he was busy doing what he's doing. So he doesn't have time for that. That thing happened in Jani. My son doesn't live in Jani, he lives in the UK. Okay. And he's consumed by his work. Okay. And I want Alaji, I can tell him, I'll bet any amount for anybody to prove or say that is my son. He's shorter. He's this, in, you know, okay. so. Okay. So let's go to some key issues. Social media was a goal yesterday that you had a vice presidential candidate already, you know, Yusuf Dati Baba Ahmed. I mean, what's your take on that? What's your take on vice presidential candidates? And also, I'd like to ask you, since you're speaking about the issues, you were in Morocco at some point, you were in Egypt, you said you're going to study the past sector. A lot of people are saying, why don't you talk to the stakeholders here? That shows that you're not prepared for this job when you're going around to study. Okay, two well, two, two things. The issue of vice presidential candidates, um, we're talking to quite a number of people, and you know, that is that I mentioned, is very qualified. I, I wish he's the one, you know, because what am I trying to do? It's people like him that I actually would like to work with. One, I wish I can work with a, somebody who is much younger, because we need to start lowering the, 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 this barriers of this and bring people, younger people with fresh ideas, with have something to offer, then just keep recycling this um, ourselves and claiming we have been there too for several times or is our turn or is that children. No, 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 we need to start dealing with. It. So that we're talking to and we will announce it as soon as we're ready, and which will be very soon. On issue so are you confirming you're confirming that you're speaking to Dati and other aspirants? There's, and, some, there's quite a number of people and, who are speaking. And Dati might be the person because he's... So I, I said, look, look at what I said. I said, yeah. I wish he's the one. He's qualified. Okay, you, you wish he's the one. Yes. So you have a soft spot for him. Yes, yeah, of course. And a few others, you know. I want somebody who is competent. You, you, you need to... We need to... I want to... I said, I'm building a team. Okay. Refire, I'm building a team. That team has to be a team that is formidable, a team that cannot take, even for me as president, anything. 
I want to assemble the type of team I had in Anambra State where, and I said to them from day one, if you agree with me in three meetings, you go. That means you don't have your own idea. I want those who can look at my face and say, Mr. President, you're wrong. And you're wrong. Because I don't know everything. And that I want to learn. Deal for you. Eh? That Yusuf Dati Baba. Oh, yes, of course. If I want people that can come in there and say to me, like, to know, oh, you're wrong. You can't do this. Because that's what we need. We need to save this country. And you can only do that with the team. On the issue of my traveling, let me tell you, leadership and learning is inseparable. If they tell you somebody is doing something well, you go and learn. What are they doing? What are they not doing? And that has taken me, from the time I've started this experiment or getting involved in politics, I've been to 31 countries learning. It is important, it's critical. You ask specifically, I was in Morocco. Why did I go to Morocco? Morocco, just to show you, Morocco is about 36 million. Their export last year was over $50 billion. They don't know this on oil. In our own, with oil included, it's under $30 billion, and we're $200 million. Morocco didn't export any oil. But if the natural resources were small, it was mainly manufactured goods. You vehicle alone was almost 10 billion. In Morocco, Morocco runs the best airport, uh, seaport in Africa, doing twice the tonnage, cargo tonnage of the, all the Nigerian ports two together. Morocco. So I have to go there. Morocco is doing so well that today, Morocco issues bond. Euro bond at two three percent. Nobody can today in Nigeria. People are skeptical about buying Nigerian bond, even at fourteen fifteen percent. So a differential of about ten to thirteen percent. Morocco I had to go and see what they're doing. I drove from Rabat, the capital, to the port. In three and a half hours, no police, no thing. Check road, go to the port. You won't even know. You think there's nothing happening in the port. I was there. I they viewed the people and everything. That's why I went there. To know what they are doing that we're not doing. You learn. I went to Egypt. Egypt, Vietnam, India, they plot the highest, fastest electricity in the past five years. And I said, let me start with Egypt. I'm going to go to the other ones. Egypt moved their power generation distribution from less than 20,000 in 2015 to okay. today, 58,000. Those who are asking don't know what happened. That's what they did. You need to go and see what they were able to do. Today, Egypt power requirement is 30,000 megawatts. Okay. Their generation and distribution is 58,000. Mm. I want to study who did the plant, where are the contractors, how did they get the funding. I've been able to ascertain, I visited the two plants, mm. went to the company that built it, made with the CEOs, not the small people, the CEOs of the companies that are involved, went to the poor holding company of Egypt, met the top people in government who are involved in this, you know, talked a bit with the financiers in Egypt. I've also gone to Europe to meet the financiers. Refi, what you hear, what you see here, that people go into government and start giving excuses. What I saw when I came in, what was it? I want to see everything now, calculate the sources on which I'm going to solve it. So when I go there, I hit the ground running. That's what I did in Anambra are, State. people are saying, I, have you talked I'm to talking the local the, I'm talking to the stakeholders. And what are they yeah. telling you about the power sector here? The same, the, based on what they told me is why I'm studying this. That's why I'm going to. I don't want to come there and they said, fine, I don't want to go there and start giving excuses. 
the job of a leader is not to give excuses, it's to solve a problem. I don't want to be one of those who will be hired, and when I go there, I start reminding them of where they're coming from. When you're hired, you're hired because the person there is not doing well. So your job so is after to... after talking to the local people here, that's when you went to Egypt to look completely, for solutions? Completely, completely. And the local I, people here didn't provide any solutions? No, 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 no. They have their... They, you have to blend all these ideas. They have to, they've done their own and everything. Let me take, give you an issue of security. I was with the idea of police the other day. I ran asked him this, but I was asking him, because you must solve this thing. There's other people I'm going to talk to, Minister of Finance, Minister of Planning. You have to know all this is before you get in there. Know when you go in there, say what you saw. You must see everything before you get there. So I so want to take you back to how you talk to the local people here. Yeah. Tell us why. Because in Egypt, they have the same agreement, don't they, with Siemens, as we have here, Siemens Presidential Initiative in three phases, upgrade of our transmission grids, discos, new power stations. It simply has not worked here yeah, thus the, far. Yeah. Why? Because, because we're not serious. Period. In this political way, let me tell you, in Egypt, to conceive a power plant, from beginning to end, to so say, we're going to, you are Rascom, you are Siemens, we're going to combine, you're going to build this power plant. All the things they need to do last there for the five days. In Egypt, they put power, security of life and property, education, health and power as a national security issue. Very soon, because they found out that the, one of the things that cost, contributed to riots of 2011, 2012, when they did the other strings, was power. Small businesses did not have power, so they collapsed. And they contributed to that, and people were unemployed. And that was a problem. So they looked at the education, the children, people, education, all those issues were bundled and they put it at national, and they're dealing with it decisively. So if you go to Egypt and see what they're doing in education, in health, in security, and everything, give you the issue of the power system. If you go to the power holding company, on the wall of the CEO, chairman of power holding company, you see all the generations, all, the, all of it, all the distribution utilization, the day I was there, the entire utilization was 27.8 thousand megawatts. Total generation was 52,000. So they have almost double that amount. They're not utilizing. If you go to the same thing, the minister, the same thing, in the place, there's organization. So here, we don't have that. It's all stories. They've told me meetings upon meetings. That's why I said I must learn. Why is this not happening? Let me know whether we are cost. Or are we the cost? That's what I went to do. And that's what I'm studying everywhere. So that's that's what I did you can't be told. You have to actually see it there, observe it, experience it, and Completely. That's why I went to the port. Why would Morocco, with 36 million people, have a, 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 a tonnage to have a better port than we have with 200 million people. Let, let's, okay. Okay, let's talk subsidies. In the last 10 years, subsidies has got over 40 billion. It's a sinking pipe. What would you do about subsidies? Would you remove subsidies? What's the definitive answer? Well, uh, you, you, uh, thank you. I was going to mention that is, we have spent over 40 billion dollars in subsidies. Mm. You're fine. Our total education expenditure in the past 10 years, total education expenditure in the past, in fact, 12 years, is about 8 trillion. Mm. So about 10, in 10 years, about 8 trillion. 8 trillion is about 20, let me use 400. It's about $20 billion. Mm. Tell me, Rufai, which country of the world, the most Two critical, two critical, two critical engine of development is health and education. 
and your expenditure in health and education in the past 10 years is about $20 billion. Go and check the records. And you spent 40 in subsidy. $40 billion. $40 billion subsidy. Mm -hmm. Refine to even add. The, this is 50% of it. If we have spent the next 20 billion in power, we would have been generating and distributing today 20,000 megawatts. Of we electricity. spent 16 billion or 16 trillion thereabouts in the opposite of this. They keep using that 16 billion. Then for me, in power. for me, yeah. I don't want to deal with the issue of the past. That's what they said. Vast adjustment, but I'm saying in the past 10 years, and I'm talking about 2010 or 2012 to 2022. Within this period, this is what we have spent in subsidy alone. Yeah. That means subsidy alone would have solved a lot of our issues in education, in health, and in power. If we have 20,000 megawatts of electricity today, I can assure you that we'll be growing at more than 4% and would have added over $100 billion in our GDP. So what it is is that this is just subsidy. Within the same period, as you know, mm. we've borrowed $90 billion. Mm. So subsidy of 40, you borrowed about $90 billion. Mm which you are servicing, if you put the debt servicing, you could see a total mismanagement of resources that would have changed the entire north. That vast land would have been a huge farmland. But, but sorry to cut you in. The argument has always been over the years. It is labor that has been stopping the government from removing subsidies. You remember 2012 Occupy Nigeria protest, labor, and now you are in the party set up by the Labour Party, and you are a free market capitalist in the party called Labour Party. So no, labor no, no, has no, also no. played a role in stopping no, the removal no, of subsidies. No, All this you. while, that's another argument. No, no, let me tell you the argument. Let me tell you, is people, it is not entirely so. Labor has never been against stopping of subsidy. Can, can you convince labor no, that No, let me that tell you, you we will do it properly because Refine, if you audit what we are importing and consuming, there's no way we'll be this amount. And you have to convince people. Let me tell you why people are against removal of subsidy. People are against removal of anything because whenever it's been done, they did not see the benefit. We did privatization. We didn't see the benefit. What we did is that we privatized profits, socialized losses. We did everything we've done. We did all that things here that have been done everywhere. If you say you're going to remove this, what are we getting here? The problem you have in Nigeria is that they've removed this. Nobody got anything here. So we are going to do it in such a way that it will be transparent. This is the amount we, of our importation. This is the amount we're going to spend. And if we reduce it or do this, this is what you're going to get. And you deliver that. People will believe you. I've been able to return schools in Anambra State or do things that when I was doing it, people say, no, you cannot do it. Have you go and watch what my former head of service wrote? Stinginess as a strategy of development. He showed how I cut the cost of everything and showed what I used it to do. You must not come and say, we're going to remove this. What are we going to get as a remove? Because of mistrust. Because the whole thing has been embedded in transaction and stealing of, you know, so people are not, don't want to hear it. But you cannot spend that amount of subsidy when you health, education, and pulling people out of poverty, suffering. So you remove subsidy? Well, like I said before, Everything has to be, if this is going to happen, this is the result. Would you remove subsidy? We have to look at it critically. Would you remove yes. subsidy? Remember what I said, yes and no. We have to study, I will remove it, but I have to offer them what will be equivalent 
of what we are removing. So your answer of subsidy is yes and no? Yes. And yes. No. Would you yes. remove subsidy? Yes. But because yes, I, because I'm going to use the resources to do something that will benefit. But if I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to remove it. Okay. You must be able to offer something in replacement of what you're trying to do. I cannot spend $40 billion on subsidy and spend 50% of that in education and health. Even in security. Where our security budget has not been up to that. Are you saying that subsidy is more important than security of life and property? These are things you must do. You must be able to say, if we keep this, we will not get this. If we keep this, we will not get this. But because of mistrust, I will say that subsidies are scam. And I still maintain it. So we have to look at it. How much are we importing? Who is consuming it? Why are we going to keep this? And there's so many scams all over the place, including the cost of governance. We're going to look at it. It's not going to be a business as you are going. And that is why, why people are telling you, oh, it's good as the economy. It's not good as this. It's not as good because they know that if I'm at the number one position, I'll be able to say, no, you can't continue with this. So they want a situation where it will continue, but let Peter be, be as If I'm qualified to be vice president, I'm qualified to be president. Okay. On that note, we'll take a short break. Please stay with us. We'll be back with more with Peter Obi. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Still with us is presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Mr. Peter Obi. Thank you for staying with us, Mr. Obi. So you. before the break, we were talking about your field trips, is how I'll call them, because that's an integral part of education. You don't just get education in the classroom, you go on field trips. So you went to Egypt, you went to Morocco, and you were talking about what you observed there. You mentioned the ports. How will what you studied over there impact us here, should you emerge as Nigeria's president? We have underutilized the blue economy quite clearly. How will you address issues of bottlenecks at the ports, bottlenecks on the roads, infrastructure around the ports, cargo turnaround, issues like that? Well, you know, I'm, from, I'm been a businessman. I remain a businessman. So I know the enormous cost on businesses and trades because of the bottlenecks at the ports. And I can tell you, this will be decisively addressed, not only just to, to remove the bottlenecks, but to make ports to become what it should be. Nigeria have what it takes for our ports to contribute at least three, four times what is contributing today to our revenue because of our size, and we can have ports for turnaround, for transshipment, in Port The deepest part of the ocean is Port Harcourt area. And it's at the tip. That can use for transshipment. There's a lot you can do with the ports. After what is Singapore that we, we pride ourselves and talk about every day, living on, is the ports. That port today is doing business and generating and have Managing over 200 billion in ass dollars in assets. That's what we need to do. We need to, you know, open up the economy of the place. Make it productive. Like I said, the vast land in the north should be farmlands. Why Kanu and Kaduna should be a processing center where we're moving goods for export. These are what I've studied, this is what I'm going to do. If you drive from Rabat to the seaport in Tanger in Morocco, all you see is farmland. If you're on the air, landed on anywhere, all you see is farmland. In Nigeria, you see vast land and people who are looking for food. These people can be moved from here to here by supporting them, by having critical policies that will help. If you generate power, you will know what power can do to an economy is immeasurable. You have small businesses spring up all over the small production that can help 
When we talk about all these countries who are doing well now, go and see MSMEs are contributing 60-70% of both their economy and employment everywhere in the world. Except here because they are collapsed. Nobody is supporting them. They don't have the power. Even the big corporations, they are having problems now with issue of power. So we are not doing anything. We are not exporting enough. Because of it today, we don't have foreign exchange even to service our debts. There's no reason why Nigeria should not be exporting at least, at least, 300 billion worth of exports, not under 30 billion. I said it before, Vietnam, with a quarter of our land, 330,000 square kilometers of land, half of our population, 100 million people, their total export last year was $312 billion. And they all manufactured goods, electronics is something billion, clothing, which we are doing in our band everywhere, 37, 32 billion. Footwear, 23 billion. And we are earning 16 billion from oil. Footwear that you can do everywhere. In you know, China, buy Kanu. Kanu used to be a manufacturing center. All the manufacturers in Kanu are complaining. I visited the biggest rice farm uh, processing plant in Kanu last year, Unza, because I had to support it. And that's what I'm talking about when people are talking about East or West or this. I visited Unza. We are supporting him financially. And he's doing the right thing. That's what we should be talking about. Not talking about who is from a, a lower ladder or upper ladder. If the man from lower ladder will do the job, let's bring him to do the job so we can solve these problems. Okay. And that's what I need. Okay. we need. We've been having the port problem. We've not been able to solve it. What specifically would you do to make turnaround time in port about 24 hours? They just put in an app called ETO. We can still solve the problem. Specifically, the first three steps. And secondly, when are we going to see your manifesto? Let me tell you. <clears throat> Let me start with the issue of my manifesto. We're going to see it. Refine. Britain to today oppress on written constitution. Get all these glossy things people write. Let's look at the man who is saying this and who is writing all this. I can hire professors in university and they write something that I don't even believe, that doesn't even make meaning to me. I'm saying, go and look at my records, whatever I've told you. I've experimented in private sector, in public sector. So there's a reference to what I'm saying I will do. When it comes to the issue of ports that you said, I said, I'm a trader. I know the enormous cost. If you borrow money today, Rufai, and say you're going to do importation from UK to Nigeria, you borrow money, say, okay, Nigeria, if you're governor, you borrow money at 20%. If you're very lucky, let's say you borrow 10 million naira, so you're going to pay 2 million at the end of one year. You start to do importation, first is that you will not find the dollar. If you find it, you, you import goods, you pay for it, and then from UK, it takes two weeks to come to Nigeria. It takes you three months to clear a Nigerian port. So what will you do to change so, that? So you are paying interest for three months on your two million for nothing. You can change it. You clear goods in Kotonu in two days. I'm just Put it, even do it in one day. You do it in Ghana, do it in Africa coast. I've been involved with the port. I've actually been a part of probing the port. I've actually traveled because of the port to Singapore and everything. I've studied what works So in what the port. would you do to make it like Ghana and Kotonu, specifically? Like, very simple. Yes. It's a human factor. Okay. And you deal with it. It's a human factor, quote me anywhere. It has nothing, what they do there is not different from what we do here. All we need to do is a human, I tell people what we did in education in Anambra City, and why do I want to use that example? We moved from 26 to 21. We didn't change the teachers, it was the same teachers. We didn't. No, we didn't hire new people. We didn't do anything, it was the same people. But when they saw the body language of this, leader what he wants and people were being asked to go if you don't deliver it they delivered it everything you're seeing in nigeria has not worked whether it's um, uh, scanning whether it's human factor 
Because you deal with it decisively. But for people say it might be easy in a number, but it might not be easy as Nigeria as a whole. I because said bigger it, country. it will be the same thing. Exactly the same thing. Quote me anywhere. I've been involved in the banking industry. Go and check. We took the smallest bank and became 25 billion bank. I was a chairman. You can go and check the record. I've been a social businessman. In Anambra State, let me tell you, Anambra is very difficult. It's the most difficult state to govern in this country, if you don't know. So it is, we will beg people, we will plead with people, we will dialogue with people. We're not going to shoot them, we're not going to do this. Thing. My, we are asked, you could see me every day, begging, appealing, and we will do it, but we will be decisive. Because it must work. We want this to become an engine of production. What has changed countries is production. Go and check even in Europe. The Spanish people were enjoying and selling their gold when Netherlands was busy investing in production. Today, Spain is a problem. Netherlands is doing well. A country with 33,000 square kilometers of land and far less population. Total export last year was $650 billion. I must get this place to work. So what I'm hearing here, the recurring theme, is that a lot of our failings so far are due to human behavior, whether it's political will or just generally how we conduct ourselves. Which leads me to my question about some of your supporters who attack, vilify people who don't agree with you or support you. How do you address that more militant and of your supporters that obviously have contributed to what's been described as a Peter B phenomenon, but some people find it off-putting. Well, let me tell you, I don't um, agree entirely. Some of those people you're hearing, or who have been people, are not my supporters. They are people who have been paid by my opponents to infiltrate my supporters and do wrong. And then they say it's P2B supporters. I'm telling you, some of them. And today, people are being paid. In fact, what they say and do to me is far more than what they do to any company. People are being paid to say all sorts of things about to be labeling me is incompetent, labeling him whatever it is, is just like it's the issue of my son. My son, for example, like I said, is a hard-working young man. Since he left the university, he never asked me for one pound. He will tell you, I'll end the money. I have always cared about Nigeria. He will always tell me, say, listen, if I tell my son now, I'm going to buy you this. He said, listen, sir, listen, daddy, you have a lot of people you're supporting in Nigeria. I can support myself, support them. I'm dad, if you say this thing, you, I have a lot of my friends. Let me tell you, I'm in last discussion with my son. He said, a lot of my friends want to go back to Nigeria. But they have fear about this. this is, a, is there any way, if you have opportunity, you can make it better for all of us to come back? We want to come back. He was born, raised in the UK, went to school, is working, and he feels for the Nigerian child every day. As you know, my daughter had to even come back and start teaching in a secondary school here. So that's where they feel. They feel, what can we do to help? If I say to any of them, I'm going to say, take the money. You have people you're paying for. Why don't you support this school? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? I, I saw you giving computers to school. Keep doing that and everything. He has, they have so passionate about, why don't we do good? Why don't we do this? So for me, I don't have people. And that's why most of the time, you even see me, and, you know, apologizing and doing this. If they even say to me, you have to stop apologizing, but I said, listen, this is me. I want to show people love when they show hatred. When you say people in the north, for example, will not vote for me, they are voting for me is that I'm going to solve their problem. I want people in the east to vote for people based on their competence. Not vote for Peter okay. because he's from the East. Okay. 
Real quickly, so I, I got a couple of questions here while you were speaking, and yes. we'll just go through some of them. Yeah. A lot of people say you keep talking about Anambra, but did you hold local government elections where you were in Anambra? How did you hold the local government money? They're also asking that, why are you not in Oshun now campaigning for the candidate of your party in Oshun State? And they are also saying we should ask you that, would you restructure Nigeria, yes or no? Those three questions. Okay, fine. Local government election. Go, fine, I'm giving you a mandate. Go to Anambra State and see why local government election was not held when I was there. Those who went to court against it are those who are asking you this question. Two, who are asked how their money was managed. It's simple. Just, I'm going to bring journalists, investigative journalists, who will go. And if they say, tell you that there's anywhere Peter will be, was managing local government funds and everything. Well, in fact, it was most, one of the most efficient managed funds while I was there. Because that's how we cleared that the $5 billion Naira worth of pension and gratuities being owed to them. My commissioner for local government was as okay no more. We well, ask anybody. It was one, it's one of the toughest women, women you can work with on the surface of the earth. When she says no, you can't even, I know you know, and this is my senior, will even tell me, hey, please, 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 my young brother, please, please, I don't want to see you in this thing. I'm in charge here. And she's not a politician. I met her as a head of local government office. I had meeting with local government people over a period of time. When I, my first look, uh, commissioner was to pay my birthday with a friend and brother who did the right work. This woman, I met her, whenever I go to a meeting, she's one, I said, Madam, come and do this job. And that's how I met people. My commissioner for health was because doctors went on strike and went to a, a hospital. I saw a doctor walking and I said, Mr. Kakua, he said, I can't leave my patients. Never, doctors are not supposed to go on strike. I said, you'll be the commissioner. He said, he will never be. I went back and announced his name. So well, that's okay anymore. I didn't bring people. So go out and verify. That's whatever I tell people. I said, go out and verify where okay. Peter was. It. So right. that was the issue. The last issue you mentioned, why am I not in Oshun? When is a local, when is the state election? You are invited. Yesterday, I came back yesterday. I spoke to the labor chairman who told me, We'll be in Oshun. I won't tell you that because of the security risk. But we're going to be in Oshun campaign. And I'm in contact with it. We're in contact with Will you candidate. Yes or no? Fortune comes in. Thank you. When you talk about the issue of restructure, when I get there, I said it. Nigeria, as it is structured today, cannot work. But it's not something where people say, we will restructure. Let's get there. There's issues. For example, let me take issue of security. Why won't the state be in charge of their security? There's not a lot of things people are talking about security. So you bring in state police once you get there? If you get there. First is that the governor should be in charge of the security. So even if a police commissioner is posted there, the governor is in charge and can remove him. I removed six police commissioners right from the time of uh, Basanjo. My police commissioner was removed under Basanja, went to Basanja, said, Mr. President, I have a security issue. I want you to, I want this police commissioner here to be removed. He called the then IG, Hindero. I said, said, so who do you want? I said, I want the deputy to be the commissioner. A Hindero said, no, he cannot. I said, unless he will be acting. I said, call him anything, but let him be in charge. That's how John Haruna took over. So that's the uh, federalism, so you promote that? Of course, yes, because it will help. You do it in, in, Security in education. Why would I hold the governor Katsina responsible for the security? One is that our police personnel level is unacceptable. We should have at least today twice what they are today. That's 800,000. No, we, today we are 320,000. Mm, so that's about 600. So about, about 600. 000. Egypt with 1 million, with 100 million people, have over 1 million. I've studied it in Morocco, everywhere. So you don't have, and out of this 320, I can tell you about 70,000 are following uh, people all over the place. Yes, sir. I want to raise another issue. 
from the interview yesterday on a rights interview with uh, Madi Shehu. He raised this issue of former President Olukshegun Obasan just selling your <coughs> candidacy to the North and also mentioned an alliance with um, Ango Abdullahi of the Northern Elders Forum. Is there any truth to this? I don't know about that, but what is wrong in Abasanjo selling my candidacy? They are even selling my own candidacy. I've said it, MPP spokesperson, speak, both the presidential candidate and the spokesperson, my senior brother, Baba Grandima, all said in PDP, the Niger chief servant and Seto uh, Malay, you know, None of them have said Peter is not qualified. They are saying that Peter is competent to deal with the economy. But I'm saying we have an economic problem. So you don't need to somebody to be on top of me when I can solve the problem. And that is what I'm offering. That's why I said I'm contesting to be the president of Nigeria. I might be coming from a section of the country. But I want to solve the problem of Nigeria. I want to start building a new Nigeria where Nigerians can be proud of their country, believe in their country, and everything. A young man approached me yesterday. I came back from the UK yesterday. It will shock you. A young man approached me. He said, I saw everybody taking picture with you. And I asked him, who are you? He said, you are the president. You are, you are going to be the president. I said, yes. He said, let me tell you, I'm 20 years old. My mother is from Nigeria. My father is from Jamaica. My mother is so nice to me. I want to come to Nigeria. I want to be able to set up a business, employ people, I help. But just like what my son would tell me, so many of my friends don't want to come because they feel it's not this, it's not that. I said, that's what we're trying to do. When we arrived at the airport here, I saw that young, same young man being interrogated by immigration, this one, this one, this one, if you know no matter, trying to harass him, trying to. I called them and said, let me tell you, this young man is coming to this country for the first time. He believes in this country. That's why he's coming. By the time people finish with him here, he will go out, he will not come back. So they left him. He came and hugged me and gave me and said, I know I can't vote for you. But I don't know what I'm going to do to help you. Can I collect your number? I gave him my number. He gave me his number. He said, because of me, he must. We need to do things that will bring people hope. We need Nigerians to be proud that they are part of this country. We need to go to sports and complete as the Nigerians. People are not proud to say we are Nigerians. Canadians are hiring Nigerians every day. Other countries are hiring them. They are not asking them whether you're from the east or west. They listen. When you go to a doctor, I've been to one, I've said it, I've never been sick. One time they said I would remove a procedure in the UK. I went to St. Mary's and Elizabeth Hospital. As I enter that theater, two people appear. They are black. One is from Ondo, the other one is from Southeast. They were doctors. I didn't have to say you can't or you can't operate me because of this. So many prominent Nigerians have seen the same thing. Nigerians from the southeast are all working in in Saudi Arabia. Nobody's asking them where are they from. Even Dubai will go to celebrate. It's a Muslim country. We all want to go there. If you go there, the only okay. Catholic church, St. Mary's Catholic Church, is built by the Emir of Dubai. It's written there. Okay. I met him there once. He goes there three times a day, during Christmas, during Easter. Okay. So why are we here basing issues on uh, it's religion, it's ethnicity, it's my okay. tongue? We want to remove all this. Okay. I want it to be turn of Nigerians. Okay. Turn of the Nigerian children, turn of Nigerian youth to take back their country okay. and I'll help them to rebuild it. You went to see Governor Wiki before he traveled. What did you discuss with him? Was it politics? Was there another alliance? And you just came back from the UK. Was what was the trip like? What did you go I, do? I went to see Governor Mike because he's a governor of a state that is strategic and important to the future of what I say. And I'm happy that so in the ports, the ports in Port Harcourt can help to the congest the port in Lagos and help to what I want to do with the ports. We must generate 
appropriate revenue than we're presenting today. And I want to see him. I didn't go to see him to, to, be, a, to be another gang up or association and everything. I'm going on Wiki, uh, notwithstanding anything. I've been very close, very cordial and everything. Everything I've invited him. Don't forget this year, I went to commission things for him and everything. I have it, so many things that are with, we're friends. In one of all those, we even supported me when I was governor. He gave me the, the, the Ministry of uh, Education when he was there. I had issues with teachers, with mm. this, because of my position. He came, he supported me with the UBEC money, with everything. So I'm going to visit every governor in Nigeria, though, to plead with them to understand. We must build a better Nigeria. Nigeria is at the brink now. Like I said, in a short while, we will not be able to service our debts. That's what we should be discussing. When we don't service our debts in the next trench, we would the risk to junk status will be finished. You see our dollar now, every day, no dollar anywhere, except the ones they're sharing, which is most stop. Rafael also asked about your trip to London. Well, my all my trips these days, you can ask, I came back with with part of Tommy, you can ask him the type of people I'm meeting. Rufai, this is time for me to meet all those that can help. Not when I go into office and I start looking for them. I'm talking to people that can help us to find the funding, find the support, to be able to turn around the situation we're in. Like I said, I gave a reference of people, you, somebody you can call. Who have an idea the type of people I'm talking? And it's just, and you can see how my, my trip is. It's one, one day. I was in London only on Monday. I arrived in London Sunday, finished my meeting on Monday, left the same Monday night. So it was a business meeting, talking to people. I have a lot of other people I'm going to see in Europe and everywhere, talking, how are you going to help us? So when I have the opportunity, to assemble this team of new Nigeria, a Nigerian movement that everybody will be proud of, it will can start. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Peter B, for your time and for detailing what you want to do for Nigerians. And I'm sure a lot of Nigerians have watched it out there and they've taken note of all you have said today.